What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Keeping Carlson Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I am your host, Ben Burnett, and joining me as always, my pal and yours, the talented Mr. E, Lewis Ezekiel. Lewis, my friend, how are you doing this fine, fine Tuesday evening? I'm doing great, Ben. I am just excited to get down to content. No time for silly banter here today. It's Thursday heading into a critical weekend of hockey, so let's just get to it. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I appreciate your excitement to get going. Let's hop over to Washington to start us off, and we have a, I want to say a very exciting outchery, but I don't know if it really qualifies anymore. Um, Anthony Mantha back in the lineup for the Caps tonight. No points so far, uh, playing on a second line with Nick Backstrom and TJ Oshie. Uh, initially when Mantha was traded last year at the deadline, it was kind of seen as a possible opportunity for him to break out. He was perpetually in the, uh, Jeff Blashill Detroit based doghouse during his time as a Red Wing. Um, but in just 10 games this season, he put up six points, averaging a career low 1.7 shots per game and the lowest average time on ice of his career. Mix all of that with his second power play role on a team that is famously uh, enthusiastic about keeping its top unit on the ice. And it's hard to get excited about Mantha returning to the lineup until we see whether the Caps might be willing to switch up the top power play. Uh, Given that he's 30% rostered on Yahoo, I think that's actually kind of high for a second line, second power play guy who ultimately kind of has the same opportunity that like a Lars Eller, Connor Sherry type has had at points this season. Uh, I I think that, you know, I I get it in deeper leagues. You want that speculative ad because it's rare to get somebody with Mantha's talent, Mantha's upside off of the waiver wire at this time of the season. Not a bad shot in the dark if you're just looking for someone to fill a roster spot. But ultimately, I am. uh, I'm not that excited about uh, Anthony Mantha. And I, I wish I was because I was a big fan of his in Detroit, and it it feels like the move to Washington has kind of evaporated that excitement that I had. Yeah, I think you kind of nailed it here. I I see him as, you know, as a line two power play two guy, he's kind of like an Alex Kerfoot with a higher ceiling, um, you know, which, you know, doesn't sound super exciting. But, you know, maybe there's that pathway, like you said, onto the first power play, if he can work his way on there, I think that would be exciting. Uh, But as you said, that second power play, we don't see a whole awful lot of it. Uh, and, and it's tough to see him, you know, making a whole lot of production. You mentioned, you know, some of these career lows that he's enduring. And also he's going to have to take some time, I imagine, to get his feet under himself. I know some players come back from injury and are, are, you know, red hot right out the gate. Um, but he's not really being put in that position to succeed. I do think that, you know, it has the potential to be a bit of a boost for Backstrom. Uh, you know, we, we, had talked about him being on a bit of a cold streak. I think he does. Mantha does offer a little bit more than Connor Sherry, who was on that other wing on the second line. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, some of these ads are, are those excitement ads, you know, uh, who knows you might, you might be pulling a diamond in the rough out of uh, free agency. If you, you know, were able to uh, grab him ahead of your league mates, but yeah, it doesn't turn the dial for me a whole lot right now. I'd be excited to see if he can get things going. You know, he and Verona both had a lot of success initially after their trade. And if he can find that kind of scoring touch again here, then then maybe he's a player to get a bit more excited about. Well, even after that initial run of like four goals in, or goals in his first four games, I can't recall exactly what it was. He did tail off quite a bit through the playoffs. Uh, and the other thing with Mantha was that he would, he would hit quite a bit. Like when you compare him to Alexander Kerfoot, my initial impulse, just based on a history of, of rostering Mantha for his peripheral, uh, upside, like my brain jumps to, well, I mean, in fairness, like bangers leagues or whatever, but averaging way, like way below his career average and his, you know, yearly average of hits per game. So yeah, it's, it's all kind of dried up for Mantha. Hopefully he finds his groove as he gets back into the lineup and, and maybe we'll be wrong. I would be happy to, to see him succeed in Washington. That's for sure. Uh, Why don't we hop on over to San Jose though next? 
All right. So lots of movement at San Jose, a bunch of injuries and outcheries, some of them sort of coming down the pipeline in the distance and some a little bit more immediate. With Aiden Hill on the shelf the past few weeks, the Sharks had really been leaning heavily on James Reimer, uh, including playing him on both ends of a back to back until he left Tuesday night's game against Vegas with an injury. Uh, Bogner said that Reimer will be out week to week. That's pretty disappointing for Reimer. Obviously, he was getting his first crack at a starting gig in quite a while. Uh, he had put together a pretty nice 916 save percentage, the best quality start rate of his career, you know, on a team that a lot of people thought would be rebuilding this season and maybe trading away some of those assets. Uh, with Hill sort of that return on the horizon, uh, we thought that maybe he would be in there uh, in time to spell Reimer, but he left practice on Thursday and looks to be out at least for the short term. The Sharks did pick up Alex Stalock from the Oilers, uh, sending future considerations the other way. Uh, I believe in the show notes you wrote that it was a blockbuster deal. Uh, I'm imagining that is uh, with a bit of facetiousness to it. Stalock hasn't played an NHL game since that 2020 season when he played 38 games in Minnesota, and he was pretty decent. 20, 11, and 4 record, uh, right around league average in terms of goals saved above average and save percentage. So, you know, we've been looking for, you know, ever since the long disastrous Martin Jones tenure in uh, San Jose. We've just been asking to get average goaltending. And if Stalock can provide that, you know, uh, he could potentially be useful there. I don't know if he necessarily is going to be, you know, due for this start, you know, this run of starts because Hill's return is, you know, impending. Um, but, you know, if he can play well, he might be able to, you know, give Hill a bit more time to, to recover and come back. I think that my concern with Stalock is that he has not played in the NHL for two years. And that's just something where we just have absolutely no idea what to expect. Um, Edmonton, I remember, traded for him last year because they had no second goalie at all. And there was a there were concerns about, I believe this is when Koskinen was injured. I can't exactly recall which of Koskinen or Smith were out, but basically Edmonton didn't even have a backup. So they traded for Stalock and, and folks were expecting him to maybe get a start or two. And then he just never did. And I, I do worry about a player just sitting on the bench for two years. Obviously uh, he's, he's not, you know, not playing at all when he's not in the NHL games, but he's going to have to get his feel back for the league. Alex Stalock, no spring chicken at this point either. We're talking about a guy who is 34 years old. I, I'm laughing not because uh, that's old. I am almost 34 myself, uh, but it's just surprising to me because I, I don't think of Stalock as a, a long-term veteran in the league, even though he's been around for quite a while. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm personally a little bit hesitant. However, I will say I was chatting with pal of the show and former guest, uh, for frequent guest, Victor Nuno, uh, prospect savant and San Jose Sharks writer for the hockey writers. He believes that uh, Stalock may actually be a really solid stream and, and somebody worth holding in redraft leagues. Uh, I will push back, too, on the, the thing about Hill's impending return. It seems like Hill might be out for indefinitely. I mean, listening to Bugner talk about the injury, it sounds like something where they're really unclear about when he'll... It sounds like something that's nagging, basically, where like one day he feels fine, but then the next three days he feels bad. Kind of reminding me of, of what we were hearing from Mike Smith earlier this year, where the Oilers would almost bring him back and then he would miss two, three, four more weeks. Um, yeah, I definitely am, am hesitant to expect Hill back soon. Maybe it'll be next week I, I couldn't say for sure but I think in the short term yeah I, I do agree with Victor if you are desperate for goalies go grab Stalock um, and just sort of see what happens because I, I do agree with him that the upside is there for for you know normalcy for somebody to a, a lot of teams that need goaltending need goaltending very badly and I think that Stalock could at least provide uh, something resembling stability to those teams, or at least I hope so. So let me let me ambush you with a scenario here, if I can. Uh, say I'm in a position where I really need to win the next couple weeks. Uh, Cam Talbot has really been scuffling. Uh, he's playing a team that a lot of goalies have gotten right against. You know, after struggling in Philadelphia, he's allowed four goals to Philadelphia through two periods. Uh, would you rather have Cam Talbot or Alex Stalock? Uh, for the next, say, two weeks? I mean, obviously, 
Cam Talbot. Uh, I feel like this is a trap question. Obvi- I, I do acknowledge, obviously, that Cam Talbot not doing well right now, but like to me, they're not even remotely in the same tier at the moment. We haven't even seen Stalock play a single game. So to suggest that he could uh, you know, hold on to a starting role for a team that is much worse than Minnesota doesn't really appeal to me in the same way that, that Cam Talbot does. Okay, just checking. Curious. <laughs> That's a, an interesting heat check, but for me, not close. All right, well, let's move on. We've got several more injuries and outries to talk about. We've got one in Ottawa where Josh Norris will make his return uh, to center the top line for Ottawa. Uh, despite his absence, he still leads Ottawa in goals overall. Great news, obviously, for GMs who have been holding on to Norris. Uh, good news for that top line. Hopefully, he can help them find some productivity uh, also on the power play. Not a whole lot to say there. Obviously, a team getting their top line center back means that things uh, go back a little bit to the status quo that was established before that injury. So good to see Norris back. Um, but yeah, the, the ripple effect may be uh, not, so, uh, not so impactful here. All right, well, let's hop over to Winnipeg next, where it looks like we'll have an outchery uh, tomorrow. Nick Ehlers, slated to return to the Jets lineup. He was practicing with Andrew Kopp and Adam Lowry today. Will be interesting to see if that sticks or if he winds up displacing Svechnikov on line two, who's been playing with Connor and PLD, you mentioned on Tuesday's show. Uh, Ehlers has been fairly disappointing this year, posted an 80-point pace last year, down to just 25 points through 34 games, a 60-point pace in 2022. But in looking at his numbers today, I noticed he's also playing a career-high 18 and a half minutes a night. He's putting up almost four shots per game, a mark he's never hit before, and he's shooting below 10% for the first time since his rookie season. It looks like he typically is in the you know 14% range. Um, his point participation at even strength and on the power play, both also at career lows, which says to me, Nick Ehlers may be a buy low option for teams, especially if he starts on line three and doesn't point in his first game or two back in the lineup. You may be able to target a frustrated Nick Ehlers owner. So just a, a little a target that I, I'm going to throw out there as the trade deadline nears. Yeah, I love that. Definitely a guy to keep an eye on just has been really nice and productive uh you know throughout his career and and i think certainly can defy some of those lows that you've been talking about uh, even if he's not able to break through to that top power play which has never really been his thing right that's like the whole story with Ehlers is uh, will he ever get that top that top power play deployment um but he's been quite successful without it so yeah if he uh you know it, it may make it so that he isn't able to to get on the score sheet the way that his managers are hoping for and that could definitely be uh someone to go out there and grab especially because i don't think uh evgeny svechnikov is too long for that second line despite his recent little spate of production well and i think too lewis like the jets have a new coach it feels a little bit like a Charlie Brown uh, trying to kick the football thing that I'm about to say here, but it feels like there's another possibility where this coach could put him on that top unit. I know there's been discussion, oh, he likes the second unit. He, he wants his own. The coach gets to make the decision, right? So I, I am curious to see if maybe we, we see something now that Paul Maurice has been out of the picture for a little bit. But yeah, why don't you take us on to our next injury? One more person to discuss is uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins officially was moved over to injured reserve. Obviously, he's been out for a bit. He appears to be week to week with that uh, shoulder injury. You know, uh, maybe not a ton to talk about here. It's bad for line three. I think the most notable result is that, you know, Hyman and Kane owners have been kind of refreshing those uh, frozen tool lines furiously to see what percentage of that top power play those two are getting. Now they are both going to be able to see deployment on power play one while Nugent Hopkins is out. Uh, hopefully his absence doesn't hurt the power play too much. Obviously, he has been dishing like crazy this whole season. Um, but, you know, these two are going to be firmly entrenched, at least for the next week, uh, while we sort of determine what RNH's long term prognosis is. Uh, and that should be a bit of a relief for the Hyman and Kane managers uh, just to not have to kind of worry about that for a little while. 
Uh, and then we have one more injury to talk about. Uh, this one may be fairly short term, certainly compared to RNH, but uh, Valerie Nishushkin is day to day. And actually, we're seeing some, you know, top six deployment that's a little different for us. Um, uh, instead of the usual Landis Cog, McKinnon, Rantanen, we've got Burakovsky getting some play on that top line with Mack and Rantanen while Landis Cog drops down to join Kadri and Newhook on line two. Could be interesting to see how things go. Burakovsky also has gotten that cold streak bump. You know, if you get discussed on a Keeping Carlson podcast and obviously all these players are listening, they all go out there and want to want to put on a show. So six points in the last four for Burakovsky and now getting deployed on that top even strength line uh, should be a nice opportunity for him. Not widely available, of course, but a good shot for him. Maybe Newhook is someone that you may want to add in a deeper league uh, since he's going to be getting a run of play with two very talented players as well. But again, this is uh, probably a short term thing just day to day for the time being lewis in a second we're going to chat about uh our favorite hot streak over in calgary and whether or not we can expect a bounce back from a top line player in nashville you're listening to short shifts welcome back to short shifts lewis we are heading barreling right into the streak portion of our show tonight why don't you uh start us off yeah, so you teased this before we left, but we want to talk a little bit about Mikhail Granlund, who's been fairly unproductive lately, just two points in his last six games and four in the last nine. Uh, this has coincided with a bit of a swoon for the Predators, who have lost six of those nine games. Uh, you know, they had really been a surprisingly effective team. Uh, and obviously the goaltending uh, from Saros had been really outstanding. But, um, you know, just the team and the goaltending both kind of wearing down a little bit over this stretch here. Granlin's not a guy you usually go to for big production, except for that run he had a few years back in Minnesota. Um, but if he was worth holding before this cold streak, like in 14 team leagues, I think I would hang in there with him despite this cold streak. He's getting the best deployment you can get in Nashville, online one, power play one. He's been playing at least 20 minutes a night. And that big time on ice is giving him an all right base in peripherals. You know, he's not a big shooter, but he's been averaging about two each for shots uh, and hits lately. Uh, giving him a bit of floor support, even if those top units aren't converting right now. Uh, you know, in the last three games, the top line has managed to put 17 shots on goal, and they have not managed to, to get very much at all at even strength. I think this is a team that is pretty close uh, to being due. So I think hang in there with Granlund. How about you? Yeah, no, I mean, you mentioned the the four points in his last nine, but I think what else is kind of instructive here is that despite that that slump, 65-point pace on the season for Granlund, his first time above a 50-point pace since joining the Preds. So definitely somebody who's had a really solid season so far, and it's not even shooting percentage spike base. Like He, he looks pretty solid. He's not going to score much for you, and, and that was something he was able to put up, you know, 20 to 25 goals in his Minnesota days. It looks like he's much more likely to be, I guess, like kind of what we expect from Ryan Johansson, right? Like a kind of a, a pass-first guy who is probably going to average between one and two shots per game and put up maybe 15 goals on the year. But if he's able to capitalize on, uh, or I guess put up, you know, 45 assists in the season, I think that there's a, uh, I think that there's upside for, for Granlund. And I, I do think that he's likely to get back into it. Uh, I'm going to take us over to Calgary next and talk about a player that we have discussed ad nauseum recently. And that's Tyler to We've been a bit up and down on Toffoli since the trade. We noted his low time on ice immediately upon arriving in Calgary, that poor deployment he was seeing on the third line and not even getting a sniff of power play time on ice. But we also mentioned, I believe it was last week, that that time on ice began to tick upwards as he found his way onto the top power play unit, as we maybe had hoped when this trade came through. Uh, and in the past two games, Toffoli has put up 16 and 17 minutes on ice and has amassed five points in those two games, including three points on the power play. He now seems very entrenched on that top power play unit. Of course, still on line three with Monahan and Milan Lucic. We've obviously, you know, given our takes on Toffoli, we've gone back and forth on him. Brian and Elon have mentioned him, but I just think... It's worth mentioning that if he was dropped in your league after that slow start, it is probably time to pick him up again while he's uh, while he's holding on to that that hot streak as a flame. 
Yeah, I think so too. You know, uh, we preach some patience with him. I think uh, Brian and Elon maybe were, uh, you know, many, many right takes from those two gentlemen, of course. Wow. Uh, I you're you're going to seemed... drag them on their own podcast. <laughs> well, listen, I think they were a little hasty to declare him washed. Uh, you know, they were ready to move on. It seemed pretty quick. Um, and understandably, you know, those first few games were rough. And obviously, this is really competitive. And I think you can churn through the bottom of your roster uh, a lot of the time. And and I understand that, too. But, you know, I, I think he was brought in, you know, not to not to necessarily uh, toil away on away from the power play and on line three, you know, the whole uh, the whole remainder of the season, just getting him kind of used to his new teammates. So I'm really glad to see him up there. Uh, if you held on to him, great. If you can go out and grab him uh, because another player got impatient, that's great for you too. Yeah, I just uh, honestly, after you sort of uh, you came after uh, Breland, I, I just started to wonder why have we not picked more? Like, why do we not have a feud with Breland? It feels like we we're missing an opportunity to start beef with them more often. Well, you know, uh, Elon very kindly edits our our audio, and so he can make <laughs> us look like real uh, fools if he chose to. So, uh, hi there, Elon. Hi, Elon. Let's we go, love you. <laughs> let's go over to St. Louis for our last hot streak. Uh, David Perron, who we have had our concerns with with his up and down play this season, but uh, four goal or three goals and four assists for seven points over the last five games. He's been providing hits and shots too, although those are coming in fits and spurts. Uh, say that 10 times fast. Uh, averaging three shots a game over the last five games, but the totals are 0, 1, 2, 4, and 8 shots in those games. So it hasn't been kind of the consistency we're hoping for, but obviously, you know, you're happy to see games with eight shots whenever you can get them. He's been providing some banger value, too, with at least one hit in each game and four uh, games with four hits and five hits during this stretch. You know, we've said that anyone on a roll in that Blues top nine is worth holding. Uh, and Pran is available in 40% of Yahoo leagues. I would go out there and certainly take him before Mantha, for instance. Um, Barbashev is another hot Blues player lately on that line with Shen and Kairu. He's only 43% rostered. So uh, if there weren't any frustrated Peron managers in your league who might have let him go in a shallower league, uh, Barbashev could be another option for you there. Uh, another Blues player on a hot streak. Lewis, I really appreciate hanging out with you tonight. We uh, I, Things flew by, and I wanted to thank you and our listeners for hanging out with us tonight. Um, why don't you tell folks where they can find our work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please make sure that you are subscribed so that you can uh, get an update every time we've got a new pod or Brian and Elon have a new pod full of tons of great quality information right guys uh please, please be sure to give us a follow at short Chips kk as well as brian and elon at keeping carlson dave Betton of the stream scheme at nhl stream scheme also recommend you check out at game day lines at game day goalies and at game day news those are indispensable accounts just to keep you updated with all the latest info check out the great sites where we research our episodes at yahoo frozen tools and natural stat trick our intro and outro music was created by pat roach and until we see you next time play smart and keep Keep your shifts short.